Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we approach thy throne this afternoon with thanksgiving in our hearts for the opportunity that is ours to assemble at this place, to lift up these songs of praise before thy throne, to petition thee in prayer, and to study thy word. Father, we pray for each one who is assembled here today. We pray that we've each come with open minds and receptive hearts to thy word. Father, we pray that we'll not only be hearers, but doers also throughout this week. May we show you to those round about us through our lives. Father, at this time, we pray a special blessing among for our sick. We pray that you would be with each one of them, that you would send the blessings unto them that they stand in need of. And as our servants, Father, may we be willing to do the things that we can for them. Father, at this time, we pray for the Page family and their time of bereavement that you would be with them. We pray, Father, they'll look to thee for strength, and may we be an encouragement to them also. Father, this time we also pray for Sidney as he is about to present a lesson unto us. We pray, Father, that he would stand behind the cross, that he would say the things most needed at this time. Father, we pray that we'd wear ourselves out in thy service each day. Continue with us. Forgive us when we fail thee. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. One hundred ninety four. <clears throat> One nine four. There's a land that is fair. Mark number 600, I'm sorry, 439. We're saying this as an imitation hymn after the lesson this evening. 439. We'd stand and turn to number 456. 456. We're saying this before the lesson this evening. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given. All
from Colossians chapter 1 in just a moment as a basis of our study this evening, Colossians chapter 1. We are grateful for the presence of each of you here this evening, those who are visiting. We are especially grateful that you are here as well. A couple of things that I wanted to mention. One, the uh, material for Vacation Bible School for the teachers is up here on the table as well as the uh, sign-up sheet for you to sign for whatever uh, class you are willing to teach during Vacation Bible School. And I see that it still has a few blanks on it. And so we need to get that taken care of uh, so you can get your material and get on with the lesson preparation. We'll be doing it uh, much as we have done in the past few years. That is, you will only be responsible for teaching one night, and so that's not a lot to ask. So let's go ahead, if you will, and get this uh, list filled up, get your materials, get started working on your lesson, and we'll be ready for VBS when it gets here, and it will be here before you know it. And and Chris, we have a tendency to forget things over a period of time, so if you'd reiterate that at the end of the service, we would appreciate that. Maybe the last thing that we say, we won't forget it. Also, I wanted to mention, I met with the Brothers Keeper team leaders a little while ago, and we talked about what is being done, what is um, in the making to be done, who is participating and who's not participating, and so forth. And it was very encouraging to hear all that is taking place within the Brothers Keeper program. All the people that are involved and participating and The ideas that have been um, uh, set forth and many of those have already been uh, put into practice at least to some degree and while one group leader was talking about what what they had done and other than was saying, well, you know, I hadn't thought about that, we can do that too. And so we just had a good sharing of ideas and there is a lot being done, but I want you to know how much I appreciate uh, the participation that uh, has been given to the program thus far and hopefully... Uh, The excitement will continue, the work will continue to be done, and this congregation will be stronger as a result of the efforts that we're putting forth uh, through that uh, special effort. So appreciate your participation. I appreciate these families who are taking the lead in this because any good program, regardless of how good it is, doesn't have good leadership, it's not going to go very far. And we've got some people who have taken that on and and are doing a wonderful job with it. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1 Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God Timothy our brother to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you uh, in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. In these verses there is mention, in verse 5, the matter of the gospel that these people had heard. And as we study a particular context, we can learn a lot from what is said within that context. In our study tonight, I want us to think about the gospel of Christ, the gospel that had come to Colossae. That's the emphasis that Paul is giving in the beginning part of this letter. The gospel has come to you in Colossae, and there are several things about that gospel and about you and about your relationship through that gospel. And what has happened at Colossae 
obviously can happen in Bremen. What effect the gospel had there can have the same effect here if it is used here, if it is brought here as it was in Colossae. We recognize from Romans chapter 10 that the gospel is really nothing more than good news. <clears throat> it involves the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. It involves what the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ means to us. We did a lesson recently on the gospel, what is involved in it, as, as some have limited the scope of the gospel, what the gospel really is, and, and we emphasized at that point that the gospel is good news, glad tidings of good things to come. Romans chapter 10 and in verse 15. How does the gospel affect you and me? And when we know that, we will know good news. That's what it is. If you'll notice in verse 5 of Colossians chapter 1, the gospel is that which presents a hope to people in the world. When the gospel has been heard, there is a presentation of hope for people who are otherwise without hope. You'll recall in the Ephesian letter, one of the things that Paul said about those brethren before they obeyed the gospel is that they were, they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. <clears throat> But now in Christ Jesus, as a result of the gospel having come to Colossae, here are people having heard that gospel, having obeyed that gospel, now having hope. You see, the word gospel comes from the same word as our word evangelize. And the idea is that here is a proclamation of good news to a world that is lost in sin. God is a friend of man and one who loves man. And as a result of that love, and we know the verses, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Romans 5, 8, and 9, God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and so out of that love, He has made possible to us the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but let's look then in these verses that we read and, and note some things about the gospel out of this particular context. Maybe we'll encourage us along the way. First of all, you'll notice in the latter part of verse 5, he speaks of <clears throat> the fact that they had heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So one of the first things that I'd point out to us relative to the gospel, that the gospel is truth. It's truth. We live in a world that hardly knows what truth is anymore. We hear a lot about being politically correct. <clears throat> that simply means you say what people expect you to say under whatever circumstance you find yourself, whether it's the truth or not. You just say what people expect you to say. And that seems to be the, the thing that's really raging in our country right now. But that should never be the case among God's people. We need to be more concerned about being correct according to the truth than we are correct politically. If we're going to speak forth the gospel, then we're going to speak forth that which is truth. <clears throat> when you really think about it, all other religious organizations offer only a guess as to what God is really like. Only the truth of God reveals God as He is. So when we begin to read and study the Word of God, we began to read and study the Gospel. We learned something about who God is, what God is like. What is God's relationship to us and our relationship to God? And we can only know that as a result of the truth. Is it any wonder then 
that Jesus said in John 8 and verse 32, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He could just as easily have said, ye shall know the gospel, because the gospel is that which makes one free. In John 17, 17, Jesus again in his prayer to the Father said, but sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. When we read of the judgment, if you were to go back to Romans chapter 2, which we're not going to take the time to do here, but in a discussion of the judgment itself, one of the things that Paul says is the judgment is going to be according to truth. How much sense then does it make for one who is trying to get to heaven to be more interested in being politically correct than we are being correct relative to the truth. We're not going to be judged by how politically correct we were. We're going to be judged by the truth. And so if we're really interested in being with God in heaven, we're going to be interested in truth. That's the bottom line of it all. But then you'll notice as well in verse 6, as he speaks of this truth, the word of truth or the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world. That's an interesting statement. Now, in, uh, on, later in this very same chapter, in verse 23, he says, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. What we learn from this is that the gospel not only is truth, but the gospel is universal. Universal. Paul on one occasion in writing to the church at Corinth spoke of the fact of what he had spoken to them, and he says, which I preach in every church. You know, whatever the subject might be, if I preach on that subject here, and in a few months, couple of months, I'm in Indianapolis in a gospel meeting and I want to preach on that same subject. How different is what I preach up there going to be from what I preached here? In principle, it's not going to change. It's going to be the same message. How I say it, where I put the emphasis may vary some degree, but the message is going to be the same on that particular subject. It's not going to change depending upon the audience. It's not going to change depending upon the city. It's not going to change dependent upon the part of the world in which we find ourselves. The gospel of Jesus Christ is universal. That's why when we send missionaries to other parts of the world, we expect them to take the same message with them that they would preach if they were here. It's not going to change dependent upon where we are. So he says the gospel here that has come unto you, is come into all the world. When you stop and think about it, there are few things that are open to all people. Most everything that we have any association with is limited at least to some degree as to those who can participate. But when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is open to all men. It is universal. You're familiar with the passages. Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And there again, the emphasis is the gospel, which is what is to be preached, is to be preached to every creature. Not some of the gospel here and another part of the gospel over there. But the gospel message is universal. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 11. Jesus said, beginning in verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your souls. Who does he invite? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. In Revelation chapter 22 and in verse 17, near the end of God's revelation of His will to man, whosoever will, let him take 
of the water of life freely. So that gospel message is universal in nature. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, and we'll look at these verses in particular at another point here in a minute. But Paul says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. All men. So the gospel is truth. That gospel truth is universal in nature. It is available, it is there for every person. In the third place, you'll notice from this context, after he says in verse 6, relative to the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit. That says to us that the gospel, this truth, this universal truth, is also productive. You can go back to Acts chapter 2 to begin a detailed study of this as, as you would desire to do so. But the message that, Paul, that Peter preached on Pentecost was gospel. It was the first complete gospel sermon of the reality of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Now, there had been a lot said about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ in the Old Testament prophets. Over 300 prophecies relative to the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ in the Old Testament. But now that all has become reality. He has come to this earth. He has left an example. He has died for our sins. He was buried, rose again the third day, and is now exalted to the right hand of God. That's what was preached on Pentecost, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. And the fact that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And that's when we read when they heard this. They were pricked in the heart. Said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, to your children, Jews, their descendants, those that are far off, Gentiles, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. With many other words, did he testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. They that glad to receive the word were baptized. There were adding them that day about 3,000 souls. What's happened? They've had the gospel preached to them. The gospel is productive. You'll recall in Romans 1, 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Why then would we not expect it to be productive? So it is productive. Now, you can begin reading from Acts chapter 2, and especially through chapter 16, and you will find various occasions of where the gospel was preached by Peter and John, by Philip, by Stephen, by others. And whenever the gospel was preached, there were added unto the Lord both men and women. And you can find that very statement. The number of the disciples were multiplied. As a matter of fact, one occasion says that the number of churches were multiplied. And what we have is a continuation of the preaching of the gospel that Peter began on Pentecost that now continues on for years and years to come and it continues to be productive. That being the case, why would anybody want to change the message of the gospel? If the gospel is truth, if it is universal, if it is productive, why would anybody want to change it? And yet that is exactly what is happening over and over and over. Whenever we change the Word of God, the truth, the gospel to any degree, we have then affected the power that God says is the power to save. All we're doing is taking away the message that is designed to save. Early on in the history of man, 
For example, in the book of Deuteronomy, two or three times in that book, chapter 4, chapter 12 especially, Moses instructed the second generation of Israel, don't change God's work. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't tamper with it. You'll find that sentiment expressed in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6. Don't add to it. Don't take from You'll find Jesus warning in, in Matthew chapter 15 as to what happens when we do change the word of God. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. You see, not only do we change the message, it has an effect on whether or not our worship is acceptable, and in that case it's not. Anything that is based upon any message other than truth is going to be of no benefit. So why would you want to change it? And then God, through Revelation, closes out in the Revelation letter, especially with regard to that letter, but the principle is found, as we've already noted elsewhere, don't add to, don't take away from, don't alter. On one occasion, Peter said, there were those who would rest or twist the Scriptures to their own destruction. What are we doing? We're taking away from the power that God has designed to save. And it's going to affect the productivity. Now we need to understand and, and don't get confused here. Unfortunately, twisted, perverted, changed messages are more productive than the truth. But now think about that for a minute. By productive, we simply mean that it brings in greater numbers. But when the final tally is made, the productivity of a changed message is going to be proven to be no productivity at all. Only the truth will be productive as God desires that it be. So, that's the message that, that we need to present is the gospel. Let it do its work. Let it be productive. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, and then building upon that faith, we become Christians and then we become stronger as Christians, 2 Peter chapter 1. So when we look at the gospel from this context, it is truth, it is universal, it is productive, and as well in verse 6, he says, relative to the fact that, that it has brought forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day you heard it, and knew the grace of God in truth. This gospel, that is truth, that is universal, that is productive, tells us of the grace of God. You want to know about God's grace? Read the gospel. And we're not talking about the four accounts of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're talking about the gospel message, which is, in essence, the entirety of the New Testament. That's what is making up the gospel. But it tells us of God's grace. In that, it shows us what God expects of us. When you begin to talk to religious people in general about the grace of God, you'll come up with all kind of weird ideas about God's grace. As a matter of fact, talking to some of our brethren, you'll come up with some weird ideas about God's grace. I heard a brother say one time that, that the grace of God prevents God from seeing sin in our lives as His children. What do you think about that? If God doesn't see sin in my life, then why does God need to extend His grace to me, which is relative to my sin? Doesn't make sense, does it? Some people have the idea that grace is, is just a big umbrella under which we can stand. It's kind of like keeping the rain off of you. As long as, as, long as you're under that umbrella, you're not going to get wet. Rain's not going to get to you. The concept is as long as you are under the umbrella of God's grace, there's not going to be any guilt of sin that will get to you. 
And why do you need to repent of anything? Doesn't make sense. Listen to what the Bible says about God's grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us. And the grace of God will teach us something if we listen to it. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And the reason is we're looking for the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it will teach us that there are some things that are not to be a part of our lives. That's, that's what grace does, does for us. Rather than protect us from the guilt of sin, it teaches us how not to sin. It also teaches us how to live. How, why we're to, to put away some things, and, and the third chapter of this Colossian letter is really a, a key context in that regard. Because in the first nine verses, it tells us things we're to put off. Verse 10 and following tells us things we're to put on. So while grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, it teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what God's grace does. It shows us what God expects of us, but it also shows us what God offers to us. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. Does that mean everybody's going to be saved? Not at all. Read Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter ye into the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. For straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Well, if the grace of God has appeared to all men, then why will all men not be saved? Simply because they will not accept what God offers on the basis of the conditions upon which He offers it. People want to talk about free grace. They want to talk about grace without obligation, without condition, without responsibility. The Bible doesn't speak of grace in that regard. Grace is offered by God to mankind, but there are certain things that man must do in order to appropriate that grace in his life. So the gospel tells us of grace. But now there's another interesting point in the latter part of verse 5, first part of verse 6. He talks about, Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world. Then you'll notice in verse 7, As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. What do these, what do these verses tell us? That the gospel is humanly transmitted. It is carried forth by human beings. That's God's plan for this gospel, this truth, that is available to all people, that, that will be productive, that's God's power to save, that, that tells people of the grace of God. How is that message to be gotten out? By human beings. Specifically, by us, the church of our Lord, which Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is the pillar and ground support of the truth. There must be a human channel. Look just briefly at, um, at Romans chapter 10. Some of the things that Paul writes in that regard. He's talked about in verses 9 and 10 that the part of, uh, of the confession that is to be made and faith involved in that. For the scripture, verse 11, saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But now, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? It doesn't mean just say, Lord, Lord. Jesus clears that up in Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of the Father. So there's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. We do what He says. Now watch this. 
How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. What does he say? Hearing the gospel is essential to produce faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. How shall they believe on him of whom they've not heard? How shall they hear except somebody tell them what the gospel is? And then once they hear that message, they can believe on Jesus as the Son of God. They can obey it. Now, you'll notice he says, they've not all obeyed our report. Not everybody's going to obey the gospel. But it is the responsibility of us as human beings, especially with regard to the church, there is that human channel through which that gospel is carried from one person to another, from one generation to another. You see, that's where we come in. When you look at the gospel as truth, that's God's operating there. He has presented that truth. The fact that the gospel is universal, that's, that's by God's design, not ours. The gospel is productive. It's God's power to save. It tells us what God expects of us, what God offers to us. But then when we look at this part of it, then there's something that we have to do. Some way that we are involved in all of this. Someone has suggested this idea, possession involves obligation. And that's true. We possess the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was given by God through the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, human instrumentality there. But now it has been written down. It has been preserved. We have it in our possession. So there's an obligation. We possess it. We have an obligation. The things which thou hast heard of me, Paul said to Timothy, among witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, they should be able to teach others also. There's a work for us relative to this gospel. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul says now unto him, God, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, now that basically says that God works through human instrumentality. Now the question for me is, and the question for you is, does God work in and through me relative to this truth? The second question that is to help you answer to the first question is, are there fruits to show? Now you can say, if you want to, oh yeah, God works through me. God works in me. If that's the case, there will be fruit to show. But what we have to understand is that God only works through those who allow Him to work through them. He's not going to force himself. He's not going to force us to do anything on this earth. Now, come judgment, that's a different story. But he's not going to force us here. He, he says that we have that responsibility to go and preach and teach. But he's not going to make us do it. If we will accept that responsibility, he will work in us above what we are able to imagine. I think sometimes we limit the good that we can accomplish because we try to think only in terms of what we can do. Our work for the cause of Christ involves not just what I can do. It involves what God can do through me if I'll just give him the opportunity. 
And so as we think about the gospel in this context, it's the truth. It's not something that's made up of men. It's not the message of men. It's from God. It's true. It is universal. Everybody needs to hear it. Everybody has the right to hear it. When they hear it, it will be productive. When it tells men and women of the grace of God, what God has done for them, what God offers to them, what God expects of them, they'll respond to that. So I have a responsibility then to take this truth, this message that is universal, that is productive, that does tell about the grace of God and tell other people about it. Allowing God to work through me to accomplish the task that He has given to us as His people to do. But then there's another question that comes along with this and closing out a lesson like this. Have you allowed God to even be a part of your life? You see, God's not going to work through you if you're not His child. If you do not become a part of His family, He's not going to work through outsiders in proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. You need to be a child of God. You need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. You need to become a part of the, of the family. We talked about this morning the, the concept of the family in the church. Become a child of God, born again, baptized into Christ. Then you need to live such a faithful life that, that God will continue to work through you. He's not going to work through you while you're living in sin. But God is willing to forgive His children as they turn away from Him and then ultimately turn away from what they've done. He's willing to forgive. He wants us to ask for forgiveness. He wants us to repent of our sins. And so, does He work in you tonight? Are you in a position, in a condition, where God can work through you with the use of the gospel of Christ? If not, why don't you do something about that? Let us help you as we stand together and sing the song of invitation. Thank you, Sydney, for those fine lessons today. For all others that are public part in our worship, for those that are visiting, we're certainly glad that you've decided to be with us. Please take a moment, fill out an attendance card. If you were not here this morning, leave that on the table as you depart so that we may have a record of your visit here with us today. Again, I remind you of those that we mentioned this morning on our prayer list. We've had an addition or two. Brother Hal Cash is recovering from his recent eye surgery. It appears to be successful. He'll go back to the doctor in a couple of weeks for a follow-up check. Mary Blanks, at last word, continues at Tanner Medical Center in Carrollton. Betty Gray's sister, Ms. Shirley Browning, is now at home, been able to go home from the hospital. You ask to continue to remember Sheila Wilson's mother, Ms. Fern Rice, and also Carrie Wilson's mother, Brenda Troop, and her grandfather, Clifford Troop. 
Eloise Bell and Sue Roberts' brother, Claude Bearden, is to have some tests. He's awaiting those, or soon will be having tests, and will be awaiting those test results. So we're asked to remember him in our prayer. Bill and Billy Nolan's daughter, Cindy Carnes, has been diagnosed with cancer. Gail Woody's brother, Wayne, is also continuing to experience some health difficulties. He'll be going into Northside Hospital soon. We again extend our sympathy to the Betty Page family and her passing, Cindy Spake's mother, Brenda Rainey's mother, and Rhonda, uh, Rodney Page's mother. The visitation is tomorrow at Hightower Funeral Home here in Bremen from 5 to 8, 5 to 8 p.m. The funeral is Tuesday morning at Hightower Chapel at 11 o'clock a.m. If you wish to take food, you may take food to the building that's adjacent to the Hightower Chapel building, the funeral home building there, the Family Care Center. They'll feed the family after the funeral on Tuesday morning. So if you wish to take food, there'll be people there to receive the food at the Family Care Center adjacent to the funeral home building at Hightower in Bremen. That's be on Tuesday. Brothers Group 3 will, Brothers Keepers Group 3 will meet uh, this coming Saturday, May 16, at 6 p.m. at the home of Martin and Connie Higley. Again, I'll remind you of concerning the sign-up list for Vacation Bible School, that list is on the Lord's table up here, and there are a few gaps, but um, we're making good progress, but we'll ask you to come up and f fill in some of the blanks so that we'll make sure we have plenty of teachers for our Vacation Bible School, which will be in July. There's a sign-up list in the foyer for those who wish to participate in the Teacher's Appreciation Dinner. If you are a teacher, or if you have been a teacher, please sign the list so that we can make preparations for that event. There's a gospel meeting that begins at Tallapoosa next Sunday, May the 17th through the 20th. Brother Caleb Campbell from uh, Columbus, Georgia will be the speaker. The evening services each evening are at 7 p.m. beginning next Sunday through Wednesday. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door second door on the right and down the hall there will be someone there waiting to serve you again we look forward to seeing each of you at our next service here at wednesday at 7 p.m a final song 678 should we mention anything else 678 if you'll stand we'll sing and be dismissed
let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are once again thankful unto you for giving us this opportunity to come into this place of worship, to learn more of you, Heavenly Father, that we will have wisdom and knowledge and understanding of your word that we can teach others, that we may save their souls and ours also. We pray, God, that you be with us until the next appointed time. Please keep us safe. Be with those who are sick, Almighty God, and those who mourn. But watch over us and help us, Heavenly Father, with each and every problem that comes before us, that we may look to you for help. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.